Chapter 3 explores chemical reactions. In looking over the Alberta Chem 2030 curriculum, you will have seen this information regularly and repeatedly in high school. The only section you may not have seen much of is section 3.2. I have moved this section to the end of this chapter because I believe it fits better there. You have already been introduced to the mole, which measures the amount of substance. Given a balanced chemical equation, chemists interchangeably, interchangeably visualize X molecules or X moles reacting or being produced, where X is, of course, the stoichiometric coefficient of the entity. You should be very familiar with the information on this page and be very comfortable with calculations involving these molar equalities. In high school, you may, you may have been taught a four to six step procedure for balancing chemical equations. Once you get good at it, the procedure can be simplified to these two steps. Step one is to balance the unique atoms first. Step two is to balance the simple molecular entities last. The unique atoms are those that are not normal, normally in chemical equations. Sulfur, potassium, iron, chlorine, etc. These are balanced first because they are usually in only one or two entities per side. The simple entities, oxygen, nitrogen, hydrogen ions, etc., are balanced last because they can vary and do not affect any other entity. After balancing, always go through the chemical equation one more time to ensure the mass and charges are equal between the reactants and product side of the chemical equation. So as an example, let us balance these two chemical equations. So looking at these, the first reaction, chlorine, is considered unique, and so is phosphorus. There's one phosphorus on the left-hand side, one phosphorus on the right-hand side. There's five chlorines on the left, so we need five chlorines on the right-hand side. Now both phosphorus and chlorine are balanced we can go through and balance either hydrogen or oxygen. Let's balance oxygen. It's only in one entity on the right-hand side. There are four oxygens on the right, which means we need to have four oxygens on the left. That leaves eight water or eight hydrogen atoms. Three plus five is eight. We think we have it balanced. Now let's go through and do a mass and charge balance. 1 phosphorus, 1 phosphorus, 5 chlorines, 5 chlorines, 4 times 2 is 8 hydrogens, 3 plus 5 is 8 hydrogens, 4 oxygens, 4 oxygens. The mass is balanced, and since everything is neutral, the charge is also balanced. Looking at the second chemical equation, potassium is unique. There are two potassium atoms on the right, so we need to have two potassium atoms on the left. Now, we've got one carbon atom on the right, one carbon atom on the left. I should point out that oxygen can be balanced last because of the oxygen that is produced in this reaction. Don't need to worry about it because changing this value does not affect any other element. So we've balanced potassium, we've balanced carbon, we can now go through and balance oxygen. So just by putting a one there and a one there, just for clarity. So in terms of oxygens, we have two times two is four, plus two is six oxygens on the left, three, and that means we need three halves there. Okay, that is balanced the chemical reaction. Alternatively, we can go through and multiply through everything by two. So this could equally be four, two, two, and three. Both of those sets of stoichiometric coefficients are completely valid for balancing that second chemical equation. Now most of the calculations you do in chemistry reduce to th these three steps. First step is to convert to moles. 
Second step is to use a mole ratio to get to the desired entity. And the third step is to convert to the desired units. This will be obvious in the calculations we are going to do in class. But if you reflect on calculations as they become more complex, hopefully you'll be able to see that these complex calculations also reduce to these simple steps. You are aware that chemistry revolves around chemical entities and chemical equations. We are primarily concerned with what occurs during chemical reactions. The chemical equation can serve as headings for data tables as we analyze what is occurring during chemical reactions. You actually have seen this before in high school. Where have you used the chemical equation as a data table? Yes, you've used them in ice tables. The initial conditions, change in conditions, and end conditions are tabulated under each entity in the chemical equation. The end conditions in ice tables are normally e represent equilibrium if the reaction, of course, reaches equilibrium. Since we are interested in how the individual entities change during the reaction, and the reaction stoichiometry dictates how the entities change, it seems obvious to tabulate the data on individual entities with the chemical equation. Note that the units of the entities in the table is also reported. You have already learned about enthalpy. You will learn about entropy with the symbol S when we cover thermodynamics. I will be using the chemical equation as a data table to tabulate thermodynamic data, which will hopefully make thermodynamic calculations more intuitive. It is rare in chemistry that everything is pres present in exact stoichiometric amounts. Some reagents are often in excess to speed up a chemical reaction or ensure it goes to completion. The limiting reagent is the reactant that is depleted first in a chemical reaction. Potentially new to you, questions may not obviously declare that you must first determine the limiting reagent. You must realize this in the question. When determining a limiting reagent, I recommend converting all of the reagents to a single product, usually because the question is asking you to determine how much of whatever product is produced. So determining the limiting reagent also answers the overall question at the same time. We are going to use the chemical equation as a data table when determining the limiting reagent as well.